Avi Maria and welcome to this episode of Booklog. In today's episode we'll have a look at a new book by the Academy of the Immaculate. It's called The Virtues of Mary and it's written by Father Luigi Lanzoni. Father Lanzoni was a priest of the Institute of Charity, more commonly known as the Rosminians. He was born in Italy in 1836. In 1856 he entered the Rosminian order which had been founded by Blessed Antonio Rossmini. He was ordained a priest in 1859. In 1877 he became Superior General of his order and he held this post until his death. Blessed Antonio Rossmini was one of the greatest Italian philosophers of the 19th century and Father Lanzoni became one of his spiritual and intellectual disciples. Father Lanzoni himself was also a gifted theologian philosopher and he died in 1901. This book was translated into English by Father Edward Hoare from the Rosminian, uh, the Australian, uh, who was an Australian Rosminian and was first published in the English language in 1903. The book is divided into three parts. Part one of the book deals with the three theological virtues of faith, hope and charity as practiced by the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the chapter entitled Mary's Faith, the author gives examples of the Blessed Virgin Mary's faith beginning with the Annunciation. The author writes that, Faith is a repose of the soul in revealed truth, a rest most sweet, like to that of John as he leaned on the breast of Jesus. This sweet repose of faith was habitual to Mary. She remained at peace in the possession of revealed truth and guarded jealously the secrets of heaven within her virgin breast. Once and once only the joys of faith which inundated her soul burst forth and inspired her heart and her lips with that canticle that can never be forgotten, wherein the blessed amongst women foretold that all men forever would call her blessed. In the chapter dealing with charity entitled Mary's Love for God, the author begins by stating that our soul which believes in God by faith and tends towards him by hope is united with him only by charity. Now charity united the soul of Mary so closely to God that there never has been union with God more intimate than hers, save only the hypostatic union of the humanity of Jesus Christ with the Divine Word. The chapter on charity is divided into three parts, namely Mary's conformity to the will of God, Mary's spirit of prayer and Mary's zeal for God's glory. The author writes that a man loves God with his will when he brings all his desires into conformity with the divine will. He loves God with his understanding when it rises to him on the wings of contemplation and prayer. He loves God with his sensitive nature when he burns with zeal for God's glory. Then the author goes on to consider one by one these three forms of charity towards God as they are found in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Part two of the book is entitled The Virtues of Mary in Relation to Men. In this part are chapters dealing with, for example, Mary's love for the church, Mary's love for her superiors, Mary's love for her inferiors. In the chapter entitled Mary's Love for Mankind, the author writes, Mary is the mother of men. They had been betrayed by Eve, unworthy of the name of mother. They had need of a mother who would love them, and they have found her in Mary. She is the mother of Jesus Christ, who, as St. Paul tells us, is our elder brother. We are therefore Mary's younger children. Jesus belongs to her by nature. We are hers by adoption. As we are by adoption sons of God, so we are likewise adopted children of Mary. Our adoption as sons of God was, brought, was bought by the blood shed on the cross of Calvary, and it was on Calvary through that same stream of blood that we received our adoption as children of Mary. For the firstborn as he hung on the cross said to the whole family of the redeemed, represented by John, Behold thy mother. 
Mary therefore loves each one of us not merely as her neighbour but as a most dear child. She loves us all because all are called to be brothers of Jesus and all are loved by Jesus. Mary in giving birth to our Lord had not experienced the pains of the first eve but she did experience them in becoming the mother of men in order that she might with full truth be called the second Eve, even as Jesus is the second Adam. The pains of travail were merited by Eve under the tree of death and were endured by Mary a nobler childbirth at the foot of the tree of life, where she suffered for all who were to be her spiritual children. Let us not forget the sorrows of this dear mother. Part three of the book is entitled The Virtues of Mary in Relation to Herself. This part of the book deals with the four cardinal virtues as found in the Blessed Virgin Mary, namely justice, prudence, temperance and fortitude. In this part are subchapters such as Mary's humility, Mary's silence, Mary's poverty, Mary's patience, Mary's perseverance. In the chapter entitled Mary's Silence, the author writes, The Gospel mentions seven occasions only in which the Virgin Mary spoke. These seven times are full of eloquence to him who lovingly ponders on their mystery. And they may be arranged in the following order. Number one, the silence of peace, which conceals from the world Mary's early years until she receives Gabriel's message. Number two, the silence of mystery, namely the secrecy which Mary observed concerning her divine conception, even with Saint Joseph. Number three, the silence of mediation, in which Mary gave birth to her son and afterwards offered him in the temple to God for all mankind. Number four, the silence of humility. During the time of exile in Egypt, and afterwards in the humble home of Nazareth, where Mary lived as it were buried in concealment with her divine son till the commencement of his public ministry. Number five, the silence of constancy, in which Mary remained during the three years of her son's preaching. Number six, heroic silence, with which she gazed on Jesus as he went on his way to Calvary and again when she stood beneath the cross and finally at his burial. Number seven, blissful silence, in which she received with delight, but without making boast of them before men, the gifts and fruits of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter on the day of Pentecost. In the chapter entitled Mary's Words, the author writes, Now Mary spoke but little and only seven words uttered by her are recorded in the Gospels. But when she did speak, all her words, like those of Jesus, were words of ineffable grace. In order that her words may not be idle, they must be pleasing to God, meritorious in the speaker, and edifying to the listener. Such were Mary's seven words. The first was an utterance of virgin purity. How shall this be done, because I know not man? The second of humble obedience. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. The third of reverence and modesty. Mary entered into the house of Zachary and saluted Elizabeth. The fourth of grateful exultation. My soul that magnified the Lord. The fifth of authority and mildness. Son, why hast thou done this to us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. The sixth of tender charity. They have no wine. The seventh of unwavering faith. Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. The book concludes with a dissertation on the Salve Regina, the Hail Holy Queen prayer, in which the author begins by telling us the probable origins of this well-loved prayer. So this small pocket-sized book 
It's very easy to read and it's just over 150 pages and it's well illustrated with beautiful sketches of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So if we wish to imitate the Blessed Virgin Mary as a person, we have to imitate her virtues and this little book will show you how to do this. Details as to how the book can be obtained will come up on your screen shortly. So thank you for listening and let's close with a prayer from St. Bernard of Clairvaux taken from the book. Assuredly, all that we say in praise of the Mother pertains to the Son. And again, when we honour the Son, we cease not to glorify the Mother.